this time on Graveyard Cars. We drive a mile on Mark's shoes and figure out what he does all day. <laughs> this is Haley Warman. Mark and Darren get a call to authenticate a 1969 Plymouth Roadrunner. I can usually tell, it's what I do. While Derek Royal and I install the engine, transmission, and cave member in Bob Moore's 1970 340 Cuda. Derek puts the finishing touches on the Superbird's paint, the body men finish hanging sheet metal, and Mark and I build out the engine for Kimberly Cook's 1970 Barracuda. On this episode of Graveyard Cars. Got that car coming to get you, I'm Mark Warman, and together with the most critical man in the world, Darren Kirkpatrick. Give me a gun! My son-in-law, Josh. Oh, yeah! And my best friend, Roy. Well, all right! We bring dead muscle cars back to life to exactly the way they were on the day they were born. If we don't kill each other. There, oh. Oh. It's gonna be a bloodbath. cloudy with the snow level at about 6,000 feet. This morning's pretty typical way I start my day. Uh, hit the key in the lock about 7.30, flip on the lights, and that's when the uh, game begins. This. All right, you little, little fellers want to see what the old Welber does in a day, huh? And we'll batten down. First thing I always do is check all my voicemails. Hi, Mark. My name is Robert Goulet. I'm in the Houston, Texas. Robert Goulet? Oh. I was just had a uh, jump 318 out of a van, a uh, uh, V5 Blue 3A, and uh, they were, but, uh, but in the early 90s, I don't want to know his life story, a, right? A T8 block. You know, if you can help me, please call me back to 281-910. They ramble through it for 15 minutes, and then at the end, they rattle off their phone number in two seconds, and you have to play the whole damn message back over again to be able to catch the phone number. Hi, Mark. My name is Adrian Morse. Yeah, hi, this is Dick at Firm Fuel Steering and Suspension. Hey, Mark, this is Brian down the Amco Springfield. Hi, uh, this message is for Mark Warman. Hi, my name is Kevin and Philip. Hey, Mark, this is Kevin. Before. I did get a couple of good ones in there, a lead on a car that might be for sale. Uh, another one that the guy might want re restored, a uh, 6060 he thinks it is, Hemi car. Um, I had an alien call, so that was kind of cool. You don't see that a lot. Usually by 8 or 8.15, we're in full swing. Uh, phones start ringing, body men are all here, painters here. I usually got to handle the parts vendors, the subcontractors, stuff like that. So usually by 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, we're at peak speed and stay that way for the rest of the day. Um, yeah, you can set it there. This has got our core steering gear in it, so we're ready for that. Is that the same number as this? Yep. That one? Okay. Identical parts. So now that our uh, EW1 1970 Superbird is all painted, we're off to the booth to do the uh, wing and the nose cone. And from there, it becomes assembly and get this girl back on the road. It would be kind of cool to get these parts done because the nose cone and the wing are the two major defining points of the Superbird. So with these last few parts painted, it's ready for assembly. And then I have to put up with the rest of the guys. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, heading back up to take care of the invoice for the guy. Lucky stops, maybe that's what happens. And that's the one thing I have to make myself accessible every minute I'm here. Well, I can't play that, hey, I'll get back to you thing because the minute I say, I'll get back to you, he's at a standstill in some cases. There's nothing but holes all across here. Uh-huh. So what I propose I'm doing, replace this whole rail up to this edge. I agree right completely. Here. And come straight across here maybe so you get rid of most of this. Yeah. And then just yeah. shape it. Both corners. Like that. <coughs> I mean, we're gonna lose these ribs. Yeah. 
I got a chance to look at the door. The door he's working on is a 1970 Hemi uh, Charger door. Those get a lot of deposit down at the bottom, so uh, they tend to rust. So I'll cut a chunk of this off and have them make, uh, I'll measure this out, it's gonna be at least four foot, huh? I really make an effort to keep as many of the original parts on the car as possible. Uh, the outer door skins on our 70 Hemi Charger were absolutely rusted out, but the door shells themselves that have spent their entire life on the car were in pretty good shape, except for, this is what Lucky was pointing out, the very bottom lower one inch to inch and a half of the door. Um, if I can put a small piece in, I still maintain the integrity of the majority of the door, that's gonna be my objective. But my goal is always keep as much original stuff on there as possible when applicable. On the way back up, I took a look at the Superbird parts. Derek did a beautiful job painting the final two pieces of that, which was the nose cone on the wing. Real easy for him to miss the bottom of that and not get it wet, but that's nice and wet, no orange peel. Yeah, you wanna leave these wings a little bit rough because they were cast aluminum. They sure weren't perfect in the factory. I haven't fixed the big stuff but not every square inch of them. The Superbird and the Daytona were originally painted as complete cars over at the assembly plant, then sent to Creative Industries, where they were made into the special NASCAR Daytona and Superbird. At that point, when they added the wing and they added the nose and some other components, they were painted after the fact in lacquer. It's not uncommon for the nose and the wing not to match the rest of the car. So that's what we did. We changed and played with the color just a little bit so it would have a little different hue than the rest of the Alpine white, and it came out perfect. Uh, it came out the way it's supposed to come out. And I got pictures of that thing when it was, uh, before we tore it apart, you gotta turn it upside down the other direction and run paint on the inside of it because that's how it was at the factory. Derek is my Swiss Army knife. He can do anything. If you look at the nose cone before we got started on it, it was Swiss cheese. There was nothing left except the top half of the front of it. That's all there was. He built the rest of that out, did a phenomenal job. Then he carried it all the way out to paint. The paint looks beautiful, better than it ever did at the factory. And uh, I'm proud to have the guys that I have here. Lucky does a great job, Robert does a great job, Derek does a great job. The ghouls, even though I give them a, a ration of crap, when their heads are screwed on right, they do a great job too. I got sidetracked on <laughs> the way up. I'm sure it's not hard. Oh man, some days just are that way. I have to pay my employees, so if they're waiting for me to answer a question, they're just burning daylight. They're costing me money. If I got a vendor in the front office that wants to collect money from me for a part, he can wait. My job is like, and I've said this before, if you were to have a duck that was swimming across the water, his little feet's is paddling real crazy like that, right? But you don't want to see his head doing anything different except just gliding through there until a shark comes out of nowhere and bites the son of a bitch in half. Wisdom. I'd love to sit around and talk about what I do, but I actually need to do it, so if all y'all don't mind. <laughs> so now I'm getting ready to uh, spray Bob Moore's 340 for his 70 Cuda, Street Hemi Orange. We'll roll her in a booth, squirt some epoxy on it, and uh, then it gets orange. And it's ready for the next step. They just got in a 1969 and a half A12 Roadrunner that they would like me to come over and validate. I don't think these are the right ounce, dude. She it's fraud. Six pack it's on fraud. It. The camera crew has decided that they want to drive a mile in my shoes. Derek and Lucky are cranking out work in the shop, and I'm running like Carl Lewis to keep up with QCing their work and staying on task for my own jobs. I have not had a full-blown heart attack yet, but Josh hasn't showed up either. It's awfully quiet in here this morning. See, what I usually like to do, I like to go in there, get my list, and 99% of the time, he is on his phone. You know, they came both ways, black and natural, just so you know. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly, so I could cheat. You have to sit there and you have to wait for him to even acknowledge that you're a being. Hang, hang on, Tweedledum just walked in the room. It's not nice. This morning he was talking to Tony. I love Tony, Tony's hilarious. But Mark has this egotistical problem, you know, and honestly, Tony's a lot smarter than he is. So Mark puts me down to make himself look a lot smarter to Tony. Did you get the transmission cases blasted? I managed to to grab the bell housing, yeah. pixie it up. It doesn't have a bell housing. It's not a bell housing, it's a transmission case. You picked up the transmission case. That wasn't the bell housing. No. 
No, it's uh, they didn't put the uh, bell housing with the automatic transmission so so, oh, much, so okay. often. No, th Tony, this is what I have to put up with on a daily basis. Yeah. Hey, Tony, I uh, while I got you on the phone, I'm looking for a bell housing for a Hemi Torque Flight. <laughs> Yeah. Anyways. Because it was a cast iron. It, it actually was, Why? right. With, with a separate bell. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I got to put up with on a daily basis. Uh, All right. <laughs> Enjoy. Uh, I'm, I'm going to work. Bye-bye. Have a nice time in fantasy land, man. Next time you should pack a bag and stay longer. So Derek finally got Bob Moore's 340 engine painted and now we can get it married to the transmission, get it installed on the K-member, and hopefully get it installed in the car. How is this? We're out here marrying these two together. And it's quiet. That's because Mark ain't running his mouth. Or Darren. Or Darren. That's oh, yeah. This one's almost in. What the f That's not right. Is this upside down? I don't think these are the right mounts, dude. Damn. We've been marked. Yes, we have. Yep. Mark gets in a hurry. The motor mounts don't fit. Either they're put on wrong or they're the wrong mounts altogether. My assumption, it's Mark's fault. I'm not bitching. I know Mark has a thousand different things to do. I don't want to watch. I don't want to watch. Give me a way to watch. OK. This is Haley Warman. Haley Marie Antoinette Janae Comet Warman. <laughs> I don't, Maddie Warman. Are you getting jealous, Maddie Warman? Oh, I can only hold one tank at a time. Good morning, Graveyard Cars. Just a moment, please. Mark line two. It's Mark. Hey, thank you. <laughs> All right. Crapping my bad sock. Oh. I told you we got to go over to Summers and check out that A12. Why are you sleeping? It's hot. Go, I know, go, but go. You know when Mark and the rest of the guys get there at 8 a.m.? I'm sleeping at 8 a.m. I don't even get up till I want to get up. 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, noon, I get up when I want, come in when I want. I'm Darren Kirkpatrick. You know, I admit that I'm one of the most knowledgeable guys out there. I may not be the most knowledgeable guy on the entire face of the earth, but I'm one of them. And it's hard to pull the wool over on me. So if you want a car validated, if you want to make sure that a car is real, I would advise giving me a call. And vis-a-vis, -vis, cogito ergo sum, that is exactly what happened when Jesse called me from Summer's Classic Cars. They just got in a 1969 and a half A12 Roadrunner. Um, that they would like me to come over and validate so that they can sell it with a clear conscience on the internet as being a real M code A12 446 barrel four speed six nine and a half roadrunner. I brought Darren with me because he's a pessimist. Here's the one right here for you, right here. Jesse, hey buddy. Hey, how you doing? I'm good, how are you? Nice. Good. Hey, Sorry, Darren. I brought Darren balls with me. <laughs> I'm Jesse Fisher. I work here at Summer's Car Company. I contacted Mark to come down today and look at our 1969 and a half A12 Roadrunner. It's fairly simple to take numbers from one car and put them in another car. That's called cloning or rebodying, and it's a fraud. It's just like if you sold a Rembrandt as a real Rembrandt, but your cousin did it. I'm gonna take a quick look at it here, but is it something we can get on the lift and look oh, underneath sure. it? Yep, by all means. If it is a clone, if it is a rebody, I'll have a pretty good feeling by the end of our visit if, if it's a real car or not. I can usually tell, it's what I do. You have the original wheels? No. They're hard to find. Yeah, the gentleman I talked to that ha that uh, provided me with the broadcast sheet, he purchased the wheels and the pistol grip shift, shift knob. So 69, it shouldn't have a pistol grip though. Why, I wonder why his license plate says six pack when these are really six barrel cars. Dodge is a six pack. Isn't that sort of weird, really? Yeah. You're gonna try to be nice. I am, I am I being nice. I looked at this. I don't know what the deal was with the license plate that said six pack on it. I think the prior owner of the car had some issues. He was trying to make this car into something that it really wasn't. He really wanted a Super B instead of a Roadrunner. So that's why I think he put that license plate on there trying to confuse the general public. True or false? In the 60s, Chrysler introduced a vehicle, a production vehicle, that actually did not use hood hinges. That answer coming up after the break. 
So did Chrysler actually introduce a production vehicle that used no hood hinges? The answer is true. Known as the 1969.5 Roadrunner and Dodge Super B, one of many features unique to the A12 model cars was a fiberglass liftoff hood that did not use hood hinges, but rather four hood pins that held it in place. That is Mopar all the way. Visit GraveyardCars.com to learn more. Sir Hates a Lot and I are over at Summer's Classic Cars validating a 1969.5 A12 M Code Roadrunner. Back at the shop, the Turd Herd is uniting the 340 and the A727 Torque Flight to the K member on the Moore's 1970 Cuda. So, right now, Derek Royal and myself are trying to marry the engine to the K member, and the motor mounts seem to be the incorrect size. So we're trying to figure out exactly if that's the case, if that's the scenario, but anyways, we had a roadblock and now we're happening to backtrack to, to make sure that we didn't get the wrong motor mounts. So it's, this could be on yeah. upside down. Yeah, that's what I thought for a second too. So it looks like the motor mounts are on the wrong side. We just have to take them off, turn them around, swap sides and we should be good. Okay, we're almost down on mine. It, that side goes up. My side over here needs to go down just a hair, but I figured since his side's already close. Now that the motor mounts are right, we can drop the motor in the CUDA. You know, Jess wanted Mark to just come over and, and dock him with the car and make sure it was a real A12 car, telling what was wrong with the car, telling what was right with the car, and what he might do to make some improvements to help him in selling the car. Darren, you're the only one I trust to pull those pins like that. It's not easy to do. <laughs> you stuff up, you know what I mean? A lot of people just like pulling off that pushing the hood down, you know what I mean? Yeah. The Roadrunner and the Super B, they didn't use hood hinges in the back. These cars were designed to do one thing, that was go down a quarter mile as fast as possible. So even though they got different wheels on this, originally they just had a black steel rim, no hubcap, no beauty rings, just chrome lug nuts. They had a red line tire on them. They didn't use hood hinges. Uh, in the original promo ad stuff, they used a, uh, a bolster that would go up to about here and the hood would set on that like at car shows. Typically, it would take two people, though, to check the oil. A couple things I always like to verify is the numbers in the radiator support. They should be the last eight characters of the VIN number and they should look right and be the right font and in the right location for these cars. They're nice, they're, def they're well defined, they're clean. There's no evidence that anybody's tampered with them. So at least those numbers started out in that core support. So then the next question you want to make sure of is if the core support started life in the car. Because if you took the core support out of a real car and put it in a, a satellite, then those numbers would look right because they're out of a complete car and they would have put it in over here or back at the firewall. So I just kind of look around for factory spot wells and things that might be evidence of somebody tampering with it or not tampering with it. I, I don't really, I don't see anything underneath here that, you know, give me a reason to worry. All the spot welds are intact. Great. You've got, you, got, you need the correct radiator, which should be an 054, last three characters. Glenray radiator reproduces a beautiful one. They're about 12 or 1300 bucks, but they're the right ones. They've got the original Chrysler logos. It's a licensed part. The wire separators are wrong on this thing. The wire routing is a little bit wrong. The bolts on the valve covers are just an over the counter type thing. But you can buy, again, you can buy all of the correct stuff to, to decorate this out if a guy wanted to do it. Nice and get you some Hemi orange paint. The PCB valve is wrong. It should have a, the plastic tri-rib PCB valve in it, and then it gets painted the same actual color as the engine at the same time. Maybe change out the pulley to a, uh, a black pulley there. Get rid of this weird stuff. This isn't right. Although the seven blade thermo discussion clutch fan is correct for it with a heavy duty cooling, which is mandatory with all stick shift cars. And I'd have to confirm this with my book, but I believe it. Any gears lower than 355, I think, also automatically got you max cooling. Not lower than 354, huh? 354 is lower than 355s. It's higher. 354. It's higher ratio than 3. I thought you were a Mopar 355, guy. yeah, you're right. You know, Mark is always bragging about his Mopar knowledge. He is very knowledgeable, but he doesn't know everything. And he got the gear ratio situation mixed up, which gears are really higher and which gears are really lower. Actually, the lower the gears, the higher the gear ratio. But then again, Mark's height to weight ratio is messed up also. The thing about Darren is, he is knowledgeable. He, he has nothing else going on in his life except to sit there and plot how he's gonna trip you up. So you just learn to take the good with the bad. 
Drugs. Watch your head. Yeah, Derek, please be please safe. Okay, we're about to hit the exhaust manifolds on the passenger side here. Okay, oh, what are we, oh. Oh, I, I see right here, the gearbox. I didn't chip nothing, did I? The car had orange paint on it, but the car was supposed to be an EF8 green car. Lucky and I are doing all the metal work, and then Mark gets to put the icing on the cake. It's fraud. Six pack it's on fraud. It. Fairfield Auto Group started in uh, 1986 in uh, Montoursville, Pennsylvania. We sell Dodge, Chrysler, Jeep, Ram, Toyota, Honda, just about anything. If we don't have it, you don't need it. Uh, Mark was looking for a uh, particular Challenger. It was a, a Shaker edition, a rear limited production car. Tony at Tony's Parts over in Delaware got Mark and I together. Found one, got one built, had it drop shipped out here. The rest is history. history. We do a lot of high performance parts. We're an install shop for Arrington Performance. Mr. Norm's garage, been popular with our late model Mopars. Richard Petty's garage, Richard Petty has a bunch of parts out now. And uh, supercharger dealer for Pro Charger, Kenny Bell and Magnuson. It, it's definitely a very, very good collaboration between Graveyard Cars and the Fairfield Auto Group. What Mark and, and the crew have done with these cars is second to none. And I just hope that we could do what he does with these, with the newer cars that, you know, that's out there. Well, it, it brings old memories back to life. I mean, I grew up with these cars and, and this, was, this was cool in the day when cool was, was cool. Absolutely love the Challenger. I wanted a Plum Crazy one, it's Plum Crazy. I wanted a Shaker, it's a Shaker with a Hemi. Best call I ever made was to Tony D'Agostino, rock on Tony. He hooked me up with Fairfield. They treated me like a king, gave me the best deal I could ask for. Every mile I put on it, I've absolutely loved it. I don't eat in it, I don't fart in it, I don't do anything weird in it, no animals are allowed in it. Uh, I let Royal ride in the passenger seat sometimes, but I keep the window cracked, because he's got a, stinks. Derek painted the final pieces of the Superbird and the 340 engine. Now he and the Dung Duo are installing the engine, transmission, and front suspension in the 1970 Cuda. Jesse from Summer's Classic Cars invited myself and Darren to come over and validate a 1969 and a half A12M code Roadrunner. While the numbers on the core support and the trunk lip look great, I need to make sure that the EF8 paint is directly over those numbers. So we're gonna have to strip some paint off. The only thing that, because it's orange, just because it's orange, I'd probably want to see that top. I, yeah, the whole car was orange. It was a, it was back in the day in the 80s when this gentleman sold the car. It was orange. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman out of California purchased the car, restored it back to the factory. Um, I think it's Ivy Metallic Green. What's the code? <laughs> they don't like F8? Uh, it's on the tag. F3, it's not under there. Oh, okay. it's on there. The tag's on yeah. there? Mm -hmm. I didn't see it. Wow. Yeah. A12's code F8? there. F8? F8, EF8. Yeah. So this is the same color as Kimberly's car. EF8. What are you doing? I said F8. See, right again as usual. You want a parade? But you just yeah, had to come back. I told you what it was. You didn't here. believe me again. He's like a child. He wants to. <laughs> no, Mark. I told you what it was. You didn't believe me. i tell you what. Would you like to inspect the car? <laughs> no, you're no more than I do. Go ahead. I just know a little bit of stuff. Enough to be dangerous. The thing about Darren is he just never stops. He got me on the gear he showed. That should have been one right there, you know? Clock it over, you won, okay? But he comes at me and now he's making fun of me because I didn't see the fender tag. Screw that maniac. I don't need that in my life. You know, I'm about harmony. Yeah, if you don't mind, let's try some thinner. I want to take yep. the top layers off and make sure we don't take the orange off of the actual body. I want to make sure there's color underneath that orange. Okay, not a problem. So let that sit on there and do its thing, it'll start. You can see it bubbling. There was evidence that the car had orange paint on it, but the car was supposed to be an EF8 green car. It was important for me to be able to make sure that the very last color before we hit primer and bare metal 
had to be that green. So we had to take it off layer after layer at a time to get down to that. That's what the purpose of the paint stripper was for. And that will burn your finger, Mark. It's fine. It's a pretty hot chemical. I mean, I've been around it my whole life. It doesn't mean anything. These guys are all running around with gloves and stuff. They're not from the hood like I am. See, I'm from 14th Street, all right? One minute I'm, I'm peeling paint stripper off of a, a fender with my bare finger, and then I forget, and I go in the bathroom, and I go pee, and I realize that I just got stripper on my wiener. You know, I lost two foreskins in the bathroom. I, I did, and, and, and then I come out, and I walk down to the end of the alley, and Rick Brown's there to kick my ass. That's a day in the life of Mark Warman, all right? Yeah, dark green. So the, yeah, then it's orange on top of it. So they just scuffed the whole car and painted it. Mm -hmm. Good, it's good stuff. And we can continue, well, we, can you take this down to get the full yeah. end number? Yeah, if you want to. All all right. Right. If you want to do it, it's just probably for documentation. I don't want Darren to break a sweat. Car. <laughs> Here, Darren, you need to wipe this off. Knock it off, Mark. You're fine, Mary. Mark needs to get over himself. He's not some big macho guy like Bill Goldberg. It's not a big deal putting a paint remover on your finger and putting it on the car. All these people all worried about chemicals and stuff, man. I take baths and paint stripper. <laughs> did you just that say? Never mind. <laughs> I didn't chip nothing, did I? No. I'm not even close. Yeah, it needs to come my way. Mark? A little bit. Nope, that's good. Me too. Yep. So we had a couple hiccups today, uh, but we got everything all married together. We got the engine, transmission, and K member all bolted into the 1970 Cuda without anybody dying. Thank God. Can you move it over there and go ahead and raise it up? Yeah. I want to look at just everything real quick no on problem. the bottom. Let's but... put the hood on and uh, we'll get it up in the air. You can check all the numbers on the undercarriage. On the undercarriage of these cars, special cars such as the six-pack cars, Hemi cars, 440 cars, there are things like torque boxes, leaf spring reinforcements. These are the things that you have to look for, evidence that they started life on there. You have to be able to recognize how a weld was done when these pieces were added. If you don't know that, you could go out and get yourself a 1969 regular Plymouth Roadrunner that was a 383 car, add these things to it, and if you didn't know any better, you would have a clone. Nice, clean stamp. Original milling marks. Beautiful. When Mark's underneath there inspecting the car, he did check the engine numbers and the transmission numbers, and they were the original numbers matching transmission and engine to the car. You know, it's a good car. All the things that make it a real life A12 69 and a half M code car are there. So everything that's not there is just a little time and money. Mm -hmm. Everything about it says it deserves to be restored to OE condition, and that's the kind of car that you could actually take all the way to that level of OE gold, OE silver, OE bronze, and actually place it one of the nationals with it. That's the kind of car you could start with and end up there. So, very good, glad it worked out that way. I don't like giving bad news, you know? I'm not a proctologist. That'll Thank you so 50, much. That'll be $50,000. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Darren. I really appreciate Mark and Darren coming out here today. Uh, it was great hearing about the 69 and a half Roadrunner. Loved hearing about the details about the car and the originality of it. And I hope it sells with perfecting some of the things that Mark said to do. You know, I knew the minute I saw the car, it was a nice car. I knew it was numbers matching. I knew it was a nice car. We could have just walked in. If I got a glance at it, we could have walked out. It stayed for about two hours time. Let's go, Darren. Is this a Dodge or a Plymouth? It's a Plymouth. It's a license plate. So they're trying, to, mis they're trying to mislead people. The broadcast sheet is fraud. Even a six pack it's on fraud. It. There you go, Mark. There's your car, buddy. Yeah, a pink Savoy. That's what I need to be driving up and down the road, a pink Savoy. I think you look good in there. Production on the 1970 Chrysler model vehicles began when? August 1st, 1969, November 1st, 1969, or December 1st, 1970? The answer coming up after the break. Chrysler's scheduled production run began on August 1st of the preceding year of the model of the vehicle and ran through the middle of July of the actual model year. So, you could have a 1970 Dodge Charger that was actually built on August 1st, 1969. Just another interesting fact about Mopar, is why I love them. Visit graveyardcars.com to learn more. Derek and the guys installed the engine, transmission, and front suspension in the 1970 Cuda. I, with no help from Darren, validated a 69 and a half M code A12 Roadrunner. And now it's back to QCing bodywork on our 1970 Dodge Challenger RT. 
I have a standard operating procedure here that a car can't go from one department to the next without me signing off on it. That way you don't have a body man doing mud work on the side of a car to find out that the panels aren't square. Well, that's sure a lot better with that other lid, isn't it? Man. Yep, that's a good fit. Gosh. In the case of the 1974 46 pack four speed Plum Crazy Challenger for Garth, uh, I got called out. The guy said they were done with the metal work on it. I inspected it, made sure that the panels fit the way they were supposed to, that the spot wells were duplicated, emulated exactly the way they were supposed to, so that it can move over to the next area, which is mud. Okay, so we got the Hemi Charger. That's what you're waiting, chomping at the bit for. Go, you're done with that. We'll do mud. We want to get the metal done on this before we go onto the mud on that. So it looks good, guys. Nice work. Right. Really nice. Thank you. Looks good. The car came to me about a year ago. It's from New York. Uh, the gentleman who bought the car in 1972 is the father of the man that sent it to me most recently. The father passed away in 2009 and gave it to his son. When the car got here, the engine was frozen solid. That was our biggest concern. The good news is we sent it out to the machine shop. They got the piston unstuck from it. We did have to sleeve one cylinder. The rest of the cylinders were original, so we just bored them 30 over. We put it together. I detailed it to OEM specifications, fired it up on the engine run stand. Runs great. Carburetors were completely rebuilt by Scott Smith up at Harms. That thing just sits there and purrs like a kitten. And so now where it's at is the motor is built, the transmission is built, the body is actually ready to have the new panels installed. Then it'll go into body where it actually gets smoothed out, primered, and ready for paint. The biggest difference from working on a classic car to a newer car is the metal. The classic cars, we can cut them and weld them and knock them around and beat them with a hammer. Newer cars, the metal's a lot thinner, so we can't really weld it and cut it and treat it the same as we, we can with a classic car. Like the metal we get from AMD is, is great. You know, AMD gives us panels and they're kind of made for all of the cars. So we do have to fit, you know, the, the doors and the deck lids before you do any welding and fit and finish to them. You gotta make sure they fit because all the cars are a little bit different. The most important thing, fit in a panel, you wanna screw it in place, obviously. Um, keep as much knowns, we call it in the industry, as, as you can. Where the trunk arms are gonna be, they're located inside the quarter panel, drip rails, whatnot. Uh, when we take those spot welds off, we keep those panels so we have a known. So when we put the new panel on, um, we have a rough idea of where they go. This car has been a blast to work on. But I hear Mark's gonna paint it. Lucky and I are doing all the metal work and body work, and then Mark gets to go in our new paint booth and put the icing on the cake. But we'll have to see how smooth he can put the icing on. The rear end, uh, media blast, U-bolts and shock plates, okay. Okay, and these are all the, uh, the brake parts that I have to uh, sandblast so that we can get them put back on. I've got so much stuff to sandblast. So what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start out with the biggest thing first. And I need to keep those separate from the other set, which is the driver side. I've got my nap on lineup. Looking for the differential cover. When you walk past my office and you see me sitting on my ass, as Royal would say, he doesn't understand what I'm doing. I'm ordering parts. I'm coordinating for tomorrow and the day after that. And not only do I have to order it, I have to make sure that it comes in and that it's correct. I think he's actually on Facebook. What he actually should be doing is looking up Weight Watchers address here in town. The one we're working on today is 4.10, 1970 Dodge Charger. The 8.75. As an eight and three quarter tape. If the wheel bearings are, then why are they selling us a cup and a... Forget those two cup of cones. It's a BR7. I got to order everything very sequentially to make sure that it shows up here when we're ready to work on it, that it's the right parts and ready to go on the car. It's very easy to lose things around here. Ah, right there. So these are the other side for the uh, brake parts that I need to sandblast. Okay. Okay, there's the 13800. I need a pinion seal. And then how many eights? Four. Axle shaft seal. And that's the only choice for nine and three quarter. Yeah, you got it. All right, hon, thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Mm, they can't do it. I send Josh to the local parts store with a Allen headed bolt. Say, I, I need five of these, and he comes back with an Allen Jackson CD. I don't know what that means. Where's my bolt? You said Allen. Allen bolt! Walk a mile in my shoes. Put these on. They're size 10 and a half. 
and the crooked SOB put wow. in a busted block. That looks so much better. Looks more like a grandma's car or a grocery there. getter now, huh? I'm not a firm believer that that's the right song. The camera crew's been stalking me around like Richard Ramirez at a sorority house. After QCing paint and body work, expertly validating a 69 and a half Roadrunner, and staying on top of all the parts orders, I finally get to build the 383. But first, I gotta find Josh. I'd really like to get this done before Mark comes out here and gives me another task that is not on my to-do list. Mark my words, it will happen. Hey, uh, I need your help on that 383. I need you to clean a few pieces. I told you so. This happens every single time. And you have, you gotta learn how to put the tin and stuff on correctly, so I don't know what you're in the middle of, but we're waiting on the charger. We can't do anything, so I'd like to finish out the long block for Kimberly so I can get it painted blue so I can marry it to a transmission, put it on an engine stand, marry it together with the suspension, put it inside the car. You know the things I do every day. While you're standing there like some kind of a freak, like a like a white Get trash, down. like a white trash version of the Terminator, I was about to say. I don't need help from other people telling me how to set up a rear end or or the in play in an axle or the backlash in a ring and pinion. Or I don't need the guys here for that. I do, however, need the guys here occasionally for helping me find the parts that I've entrusted to them to detail. I'm not going to be able to go very far without valve covers. Now, two months ago, I gave you the valve covers and asked you to do them. Then a month after that, I reminded you. That's the last time I saw them. Have you seen them? Yeah, there's that. Yeah, her pod. Okay, Alrighty. let's guess. Because 383 two barrel are different valve covers than the 383 HP. You know that, right? Uh, yes, I do, Mark. <laughs> no, you don't. All right, well, this is the stuff that has to get painted on the engine itself, okay? Okay, well, what's that crank for? That's out of the other 383. Remember the engine that the idiot that charged him like thousands of dollars? She wanted to get the car put together so her dad could enjoy it. Right. Because he was sick, remember? Mm -hmm. So they rushed out and they had this motor put together and the crooked SOB put ah. in a busted block, a 66 383 busted block. Didn't bore it over, used the old original piston, charged him for everything new, and they just had, it was just. That's so messed it's, up. It's messed up. So I, out of the kindness of my stupid old heart, Happened to have an L-Code 383 two-barrel 1970. It's out of a St. Louis car. Hers is a Hamtramck car. But date codes are perfect. Yeah. And I donated it. You're a good man, Charlie Brown. Well, they're good people, too. Makes a difference. Yes, they are. Putting these engines together is a piece of cake. I do it all the time. I don't need the guy's help. I don't need any input. I do need Josh, however, because he knows where the parts are for the engine. I gave them to him to sandblast a while back. So I've got to get his help to help me put that together. But I'm sure in their mind, it means they're saving the day or some amazing thing. See that? Got to watch for that right there. You know what that is? It's warped. Well, the pan's a little bit caved in right here, which is a normal patina I couldn't care less about. But it's more like, well, I'm not a firm believer that that's the right sump. I mean, this looks like an HP one. And that's a non-HP motor, correct? Right, so the pan's the difference between a five and a six quart pan. Well, there is one out there in their um, pod. Yeah, let's look at it. So the only slowdown in the motor right now is uh, I had the wrong pickup tube in it. I think it was one for a 440, which are a little bit longer because the pans are a little deeper on the 440 HPs. I got the original one out of the engine, so we're cleaning that out. And Josh is out doing that right now. As soon as he's done, we'll put that in, put the pan on it. We can button up the bottom of it. Right now, I'll just go ahead and keep doing what I can do on it, which is like the oil pump next and uh, water pump and some other things. So. We should also, in the Mr. Mopart's room, have new caps. Did you see those while you were looking for I chance? I did not. Okay, we do those. have brand new ones. They have the ENF markings on them as well. Really? I'm gonna put this gasket on for you, then all we'll have left after that is the exhaust manifolds, and we're ready to roll it in and paint it. That's it. Done, done, and done. I've been really excited about the new shop and I'm, and I'm thrilled at the idea that we're growing and moving to the next level. What I'm not as thrilled about it is the amount of time that it consumes of mine. At any given second, I have to hop in my car and drive over there and meet a contractor. Hey, Craig. 
How you doing, Mark? Good, how are you? Good. You know, Mark's always complaining about his stress level, that it makes him overeat, that he gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, if Mark would have just took care of business here at this place, been more organized, he wouldn't have to have a bigger shop like he thinks he needs now. HVAC meeting went really great. Uh, now I've got to meet with the painter. This is the interior painter guy. In a couple of weeks, we'll have our new airlines in from Rapid Air. They're a beautiful blue. They're aluminum, inch and a half around the perimeter, one inch drops. I just want this place to look like we take pride in what we're doing. We can start tomorrow. Start tomorrow, okay. All right, I'll get all the cars moved into the middle tonight, everything off of the walls. And if we can get it white by Saturday, then we'll start putting our pipe in. That will work. All right, awesome. Thanks, brother. You're welcome. Okay. Next stop for me is back to the shop and rock and roll and get on the rest of the forest fires. Oh, it looks so much better. Earlier, we got a phone call from Summers Classic Cars to go inspect the 1969 and a half Roadrunner. It's an A12, it's a real life 446 barrel car. Uh, I validated its authenticity. I made a few notes that I thought were important uh, that wouldn't cost a whole lot of money to do but would make a big difference and make it more appealing so today i got the phone call that those repairs have been done and jesse's bringing it over for us to check it out that looks so much better nice hey guys wow. nice that's the way it's supposed to look looks more like a grandma's car or a grocery there. getter now huh i think it's a very nice car a no excuse car it's not a trailer queen, but it's a very nice car. You could take this car to the shows or anywhere you want to go and be very proud of it. That looks good. So you polished it a little too? Yeah. Summers had done a good job on uh, listening to my advice. I really felt that the wheels and the tires would go a long way, getting the hood right. Those were the biggest things. They didn't spend a lot of money, but made the car more presentable and more original. Certain things have to be right. If, if a 15 inch all black wheel with chrome lug nuts is the way this car started life and people know them for that, then they should be on there. Same thing for the hood. It's fiberglass liftoff hood. It's supposed to be a matte black. Now it's a matte black. It looks right. So I think he'll do well with it. And I appreciate the fact that he listened to my advice and did something about it. You couldn't change the license plates, huh? No. It's a Dodge. He knows that. We covered that. Well, he should have fixed it. It's got Dodge license plates on it. It's a Plymouth. It should say six barrel, not six pack and license plate. OK, the nomenclature is it should be a six barrel. And the license plate says six pack. Nobody cares. But in Darren's mind, that just set him way up here on this huge pedestal that he's super knowledgeable guy because he picked it out. I think that's false advertising, maybe even fraud. Six pack, six barrel, no matter how you slice it, it comes up three, two barrel. I was gonna buy the car, I was gonna write him a check, but I saw the license plate said deal over. It's a deal breaker right there. If I owned that car, I would probably just drive it till I was dead. Because you don't have to go and restore it. This is a hard top. It's a 69 and a half Roadrunner M Code A12 car. They didn't make many of them. This has got the original engine, original transmission, original rear end, mostly original sheet metal on it. You could drive it the way it is, or you could drive it the way it is for five years, disassemble it, and do a Concours restoration. But everything is there to do either one. Well, thank you for honoring me enough hey. to take my advice and, thank and you. do it. It looks thank really you so good. Much. I love it. I, I love the uh, the sinister look of the car. The 69 and a half A12 Roadrunner is very rare, um, very enjoyable car to drive, and uh, really goes if you put your foot in it. This Mopar is way too much of a car for him. Next time on Graveyard Cars, Derek and I work on the rear end of the Walton's 1972 Rally Charger. Larry gets the vinyl top installed. Derek and myself get the dash put together, and Mark struggles with the decision of making the emblems on the car match his pictures or how the factory intended them to appear. We get the rear lights, exhaust, door panels, back seats, trim moldings, carpet, and windshield wipers installed. But that's not going to mean anything unless we get this engine running. Find out on the next episode of Graveyard Cars. <laughs>